So thanks, Brian. I am happy to have uh, the opportunity to speak with you today. It's really fun to speak with like-minded people and talk about how, how Lean Six Sigma is evolving and how we modernize it and how we bring the value of it to different sectors and different people and different situations because the tools are so valuable and they're so fundamental that they work really anywhere. It's just uh, being able to see how they can apply and how you can achieve amazing results. So it's great to be with uh, you today to talk about that topic, which we don't get that much opportunity to talk with other practitioners. So it's great. Uh, my background, I started about uh, 20 years ago. I was the vice president of IT for a high-tech healthcare company in the Chicago area. And through a giant uh, five company merger and acquisition, the president of the company had heard about at the time, Lean Six Sigma was quite big and said, hey, this is something that we might wanna consider. And in my role, he said, I'd like you to lead this. Here's a book. And at that time, I didn't know anything about Lean Six Sigma, so read the book. And at the end of the book, I still didn't know anything about Lean Six Sigma. It was a little elusive. So I hired a consultant to help me to figure out, I don't get it. How does it apply in a high-tech healthcare company through a massive merger and acquisition of five companies? And so I learned the depths of Lean Six Sigma by rolling up my sleeves and working in partnership with the rest of the company to kick that off. And it went great. Our integration was ahead of schedule, under budget, which never happens. And we really attributed it to this, the uh, method that we used and we really stuck with it. Leadership got behind it. And after that, the success of that, a lot of our customers who were the major healthcare insurers in the US had contacted us and said, hey, we thought that this integration was gonna mean disruption of service and all kinds of issues. We, as a matter of fact, several of them hired additional support staff for the fallout of through this acquisition. They're like, we just wanted to be prepared and everything upgraded and improved and got better. So because of that, they said, can you help us do the same thing? So I started going to our customers saying, yeah, we can help you do this. Let's show you how to do it in your situation, in your situation, in your situation. And before I knew it, the, my original role was running smoothly and I could step aside and that's how I became a consultant. So since 2001, is when uh, the company was founded and was Lean Six Sigma Consulting. Uh, but truly, a lot of times we didn't even call it Lean Six Sigma Consulting. For people that don't know what that word means, it's just business improvement. It's getting through challenges. It's uh, succeeding through changes and challenges. It's developing people. It's solving problems. So in, um, that went that way for many years. And about three years ago, I partnered I've been more on the Six Sigma business uh, transactional service side. And I met a specialist in lean who had the same, you know, 20 years in depth in lean manufacturing. I was like, I always, I, I had less exposure to lean manufacturing and he had less exposure to the Six Sigma in the service and business and transactional that we put our heads together and formed a partnership and that partnership then has become our company now, which is canceled. With uh, the last year or so, we've taken a necessary pause over the last year and we decided, well, how do we bring this now to the next evolution, which is remote support, which is video support, which is teaching others how to solve problems with when you can't be in the same room. So we've taken our methods and uh, skills and learning and put that online with an online platform with support of uh, remote coaching and on-site coaching and consulting. So that's where we are today, bringing what we think is Lean Six Sigma into the modern, uh, modern age and making it more accessible to people and more applicable to different, uh, to different scenarios. Yeah. And you mentioned that you were um, is this on the direction you're already going with the consulting and in terms of online support or did COVID accelerate that? And is the yeah. fact that you're kind of stuck in uh, Australia, did that help accelerate things or was that kind of already part of the plan? It was really beautiful how it worked out because 
we had been trying for a long time. We have customers all over the world. So we serve customers here in Australia, in Switzerland, in Germany, a, a lot of places in Europe, uh, Canada, of course, many in North America, uh, Asia, so China, Malaysia. So we've been all over. And many times we've, we've offered, you know, we can do this remote. We can do this remotely and support you and have great results. And like, ah, we really like the in-person thing. Okay, so it constrained us a bit. And we had been already in discussions about how can we convince people and demonstrate that we can actually do this remote plus, like have a blended option uh, of delivery. And through that, it was right at those times, we had probably been talking about that for two or three months and then COVID hit. And we were like, this is beautiful because now we have the necessary pause and business went to sleep for a bit. And while business went to sleep, we went crazy getting this stuff online and saying, let's not just slap what we have online. Uh, in the Lean Six Sigma world, I'm sure you're aware, a lot of people regurgitate the same old materials and it's random bits and pieces of templates from here and examples from here and a lot of old manufacturing examples. They're old, they don't apply. It's hard to translate. People don't understand them. They don't see how that applies to my challenges of today. So we took this pause as an opportunity to rethink it, upgrade it, make it more accessible and more modern and realistic. And now that's what we present to our uh, e-learning customers. And for many of our customers now who are you know, coming out of the COVID uh, lockdown are saying, hey, can we, now can we do a workshop? Yes, you could do this, do this module online and then we'll do a remote workshop and kill it in the workshop because they already have the training under their belts. So this blended e-learning with the remote support has been dynamite. It's just been going great. So we're really excited about it. And it's a way to bring it to people who didn't have access before, which excites us as well. Yeah, that's great. But I think you made a great point about having the customers also embrace this and say, yeah, we gotta figure out a way to do, work around this. And maybe it wasn't ideal before, but we have to continue, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. The nice thing is they had to figure it out first. So we were busy thinking, how do we convince them? And instead they came to us and said, hey, we've been doing a lot of video stuff. Can you guys do that too? Or like, as a matter of fact, we can, glad you asked. <laughs> so it's been nice that they, you know, it's, it's like uh, they think it's their idea kind of thing. Well, it really was. So, and also we have a lot of the recovery from COVID. So for people figuring out how to, how to change the way they work after the changes from COVID. We have some customers that have these massive facilities where they have you know, 500 and 1,000 employees at one place that are now all dispersed. How do they get the job done? So by demonstrating how we get our job done, they say, ah, I see how that works. I get it, and it's really, it's really been a great opportunity to, to cut out the fat and to become more efficient. It's been a necessary thing rather than a, hey, let's try and do this on the side while we're busy getting work done. So, you know, it's been, a, it's actually worked out great. I think what you asked me before about um, Lean Six Sigma in different, in different sectors, we have done in business, in government, in non-government organizations, and the, in the business side, we can break that down and, and to service industry. So we've been big into the hospitality industry and multiple kinds of service uh, in transactional. So banking, insurance, those are the kind of things that are uh, pretty common for Lean Six Sigma. And then of course in manufacturing, we've done a lot in the major fragrance companies, uh, flavors. We had a big company now uh, in, we're, we're involved in cannabis cannabis packaging, cannabis farmers in the legal states, of course. But that's been a whole new uh, experience as well because that's that kind of falls into its whole own category. And these are people who are experts in uh, growing a plant or in creating packaging, but can they do that efficiently? Do they know who their customer is? Do they know how to effectively and efficiently run a business? Can they grow employees? Do they know how to create a work environment that's a joy to be in. No, they know how to grow a plant or they know how to they know how to use a plant. They know that, but they don't know the other skills. So that's been uh, very exciting and interesting for us. 
Yeah, and the, a, um, I used to live in Portland, Oregon, so as oh. of, until last year. So I was there seven years, and a friend of mine was a lean consultant and worked with some um, from farms, and he just was trying to describe to me some of the challenges they have and the the data and the transparency and the traceability of all their um, every plant basically had to been documented and controlled and monitored where it went and just the regulatory piece of it is that it was just a huge uh, piece, you know, from a non-value added perspective, you know, to the state, it was important, but for the growers and the farms and the distributors, it just seemed like so unnecessary and excessive. Um, but starting off in this industry with so much pressure on there, I think they kind of went really heavy on the the, the details and that just bogged down a lot of their processes. Well, you know what? The interesting thing and the most unique thing about the cannabis industry is that, and I know this this is a little bit of a tangent, but it's a cool topic. And it's yeah. interesting when you have, it's not that often that you get something that's totally different that you can't relate to. Well, you have a whole group of experts who have been forced to work in the black market and they're experts at that. But when they have to work in the legitimate market with true regulations and all kinds of constraints, they don't know how to structure a legal uh, business, scale it to grow and do all the things and jump through all the regulatory hoops that they have to. So to them, it does all feel unnecessary. So it's how to do that and still have their creativity and still let them bloom, so to speak, yep. with their mm -hmm. skills and their expertise. Uh, so a lot of people in the industry have fallen out. They're like, nah, I was very happy working in the black market. That's my thing and not really interested. But those who can kind of grow into the, the you know, being the big boys, then that's that's really where the excitement is. It's because, no, we can do this. And it's an exciting field. It's different than any other. So it's been a real uh, it's it's been a real challenge in a very exciting way to bring it to that home market. Um, maybe the, you can segment a little to the government side. You said you've done some work in government. Did, did you talk to that a little bit in terms of just your experiences or your takeaways or what, what's working well or where is, uh, how do at least Lean and Six Sigma tools help the most in those areas from your, your experience so far? Yeah, so we've done a lot of work in government. Some of the bigger contracts and customers that we've served are CMS, that's the centers for most people in the U.S. don't know that it's called CMS, but that's Medicare and Medicaid, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And they're in the Washington area in, in Baltimore is where their, their hub is. But we worked with them for about six years, which is a long term. But they, at the, at the time, were, were led by Dr. Don Berwick as the administrator. And he was a big fan of Lean Six Sigma. So coming from the very top of CMS, he said, I want everyone in the organization top down to embrace and understand and start incorporating Lean Six Sigma to eliminate waste. And his whole goal, which is a, a great goal for CMS, was better health and better access to health. So very different aspect from working in business. So that was the, on, the, on the health side. We've also done a lot of work with school districts. So the largest school district in the country is Charlotte Mecklenburg in North Carolina. And we did work with them, Putnam County, Tennessee, uh, Williamsburg, James in Virginia. So several large school districts. And the difference between these government, uh, the government bodies and business, they, sh they have a lot of things in common, right? They all have ambitious goals. They all have competing priorities. They have resource constraints. They're all trying to grow and scale in, in some way. But the difference is that in business, they've got a paying customer. Someone is buying their product or their service. They've got competition. They're focused on revenue and profit. A lot of times they, their go-to solutions on the business side are hire more people, do more training, get better technology. It's a whole different animal when you get to government or uh, nonprofits. They're serving a community. They're serving a population, not a paying customer. They many times have a disinterested population that they're serving. The population of the community they're serving doesn't even know that they the service exists until they're in great need of it. Mm -hmm. And then they need it and they need it fast. 
So it's a very different, it's a very different perspective. At the government uh, agencies and the nonprofits, they have a very different view of efficiency. So because they're not focused on profit, they're focused on uh, retaining and achieving more budget and getting more funds. So it's a different, whole different focus, which necessarily drives their efforts in a different direction. So it's, it's a whole different aspect when you, when you start to bring in these problem solving skills. So another big difference working with uh, government or nonprofits is that many times the people they're serving and the people inside the organization have very low expectations for efficiency. You know, if you, it's like when you think you're going to the DMV, you don't expect at all to have a great efficient experience. If things go smoothly, you wanna tell your friends about it. Oh my God, I went to the DMV and it actually went well. I got in and out in only two hours. So the low expectations and people inside saying, yeah, it's just, you know, that's just how it always is. It's just how it's always been. It's a different, it's a whole different, it's a whole different animal. And then the other thing, I, I think the major difference, especially with nonprofits is that many of them serve a worldwide audience. And when you multiply that times the world, now you've got cultural differences. You have very huge gaps in standards of living and infrastructure, what's available to people, how to get the word out. So where businesses are seeking more people, more hiring, more technology, in government and in, in NGOs or in nonprofits, they're looking for funding, more budget, access to, access to some kind of capital or funding. So it's a it's a very different it's a very different kind of different kind of world. But for us, the interesting thing is that the same fundamental concepts of how to improve or create a great operation it still applies. It really is about understanding the challenges that that what's different so that you can apply it properly. You don't go into a, a nonprofit or a government organization the same way you do a big manufacturing business you know, or a big a bank. It's very different. Do you find yourself starting off um, differently in those organizations than you would like a, a traditional insurance or banking industry where maybe there's that, um, I wouldn't say, I guess they, there's, I think some more structure in place, I guess on larger companies that you're kind of building off of, there's probably a process, maybe it's even documented, but some of the other areas maybe you're coming in without clear understanding of the process is you find that you're starting a little bit uh, from more of the beginning stage um, or do you find you're starting about the same level whether it's a for-profit or a government or nonprofit? yeah i think it's starting the same uh, from a broad perspective it's really understanding where what are, what do we have to work with today so in terms of how do their operations run how much opportunity is there for improvement? What are their current goals? So that's a, a big thing is what are they, and we always ask the same questions. What are your current challenges and changes? And if you ask those two questions, you get a lot of meat from that. And finding out where's our support coming from? No matter whether it's uh, business or it's government. And, and I know we talked about uh, CMS or Medicare Medicaid. We've also done a lot of work in law enforcement. So that's it, DEA, FBI, all levels of uh, law enforcement. So very different from healthcare. But nonetheless, you go in there finding out who's, where do we have support? Where are our strengths? What do we have to work with? So it's a, a bit the same. When we go into an organization, we don't know if we have one, you know, supervisor level person who is trying to get, you know, Lean Six Sigma, or let's just let's just say, uh, in, increase their operational excellence in a small area with no uh, leadership support above that person. That's a, it's our scope and what we can achieve is much smaller. Same thing in, in government is where do we have support from? And usually we can, we can, that's shooting fish in a barrel, trying to find ways to improve and make more efficient uh, government and typically a nonprofit. They usually don't have tight, efficiently run processes where in business the difference is they have it they they might have really inefficient processes but it's all automated it's really slick they can generate defects faster 
because it's all integrated in these huge, you know, automated systems. Where in government, they tend to it tends to be more exposed, and just, that's just kind of from the physical aspect. But some of our the favorite projects that that we've worked in government that have been kind of interesting are in Medicare, for example. We had some huge cycle time uh, projects, and we took one. It was one of our first ones that we took a, a process that took on average. So if you if for anyone who's you know understands the average, you know this is just the middle. But on average, took 220 days to complete this cycle. So yeah, almost a year. We got it down to literally four days on average. And it was a, a just a, a simple uh, rapid improvement event. So it didn't take months and months to get us to that point, but it's very exciting. And then people just were, were amazed. How did, what did we do? If you had to take a four day process and say, hey, make it 220 days, you'd run out of ideas of how to expand it. Well, they didn't. So we had to, you know, kind of get that down. And then it was now all these people who used to work in this process, how do we get them busy and productive elsewhere? And that was the second challenge because uh, we, we don't want to displace people. We want to just make them productive and create an efficient uh, operation. So that was when with Medicare, we had quite a few of those. With uh, Medicaid, some of the things that we've done is to, when you think about the Medicaid population, you have patients who are not going to book in their, you know, uh, iPhone calendar to go see a dentist every six months and to go get their routine preventive care and their physical every six months. And they don't have access and the desire or even awareness of preventive care that's out there for them. So how do you get one of our big projects was in Medicaid. How do you get the Medicaid uh, consumer or the people that we're serving how do you get them access to and aware of and taking advantage of the programs that are out there for them to have uh, preventive care, which was a big, that was kind of a big um, focus there. And we had some great successes. That's a state by state run program. So when it worked in one state, then we moved to the next, moved to the next. And each state has its own challenges and its own unique infrastructure, uh, the uniqueness in their culture as well. So it was interesting to kind of apply those concepts across uh, state boundaries as well. So were, the, uh, would you say that the um, the projects related to that, are, is it a lot of mapping events? Is it Kaizen improvement events? Is it a Six Sigma project? Is it just business coaching and mentoring on, the, or are you doing project management work? Uh, what, what does that look like in terms of like tools and approaches that are, uh, pretty prevalent that you've had to go through is it um, yeah I'm just kind of curious about the the type of things that you're helping from the tool set or the, the toolbox so to speak so in the first year with Medicare Medicaid we had supported and led 175 projects so you can imagine with a hundred let's just say 175 improvements because they were different levels of projects so the majority, I would say probably 50% were rapid improvement events or Kaizen events. And of course, the key, uh, people use that term very loosely. We use it pretty tightly. So we, we do it with rigor and, and we really do do it the what we think is the right way, which is spend as much time on the prep and pick the right things. Not everything can be done as a Kaizen event. So those things where it was not a mysterious root cause where we did have access to data, we did have the right people. We usually spent three or four days, did a really strong rapid improvement event. And then of course the key to an effective Kaizen or rapid improvement is that follow-up piece where in my experience and, and when we've come, our consultants have come from all different backgrounds, people a lot of times let it go after the event, but the real thing is making it sustainable and stick and seeing that improvement all the way through. And then being able to replicate it as much as you can. So probably half of the work that we did was really strong rapid improvement events. Uh, we had a handful that were pretty easy. So it was truly just a group of subject matter experts in a series of meetings, you know, day meetings. So I wouldn't really call it an actual uh, RIE or rapid improvement event, but more of just structured problem solving. Let's just, just do it, just more of a JDI, a little more teeth to it than that. 
because they did all the easy stuff before we got there. So some that were just meetings with subject matter experts. And then there was a big group that were actual, we would go through the DMAIC phases and actually do a project. And most of them took, let's say three to four months. We, we scoped them nice and tightly so that we get rapid cycles of success and continued those. So I, I would say, you know, it was a good mix. We had some that were actually designed from scratch where they were working on uh, telemedicine and the innovation lab. And that was at, uh, at CMS as well. So we did some that were designing a whole new, you know, whole new products and bringing in technology. And those were, those were really fun because you don't really think of innovation when you think of government, but they're in there too. They're just huge. So it just takes them a little, little longer. With, um, with uh, law enforcement, that was interesting as well, because when you go into someplace like the DEA, these are people who have likely never even heard of Lean Six Sigma or structured problem solving. So it's different. It's like, it's like going to an island where people haven't heard of the Kardashians. It's like, huh? And you're announcing it for the first time and they're like, this is amazing. Where did this come from? Yeah. And you know, we know it's been around for a long time, but uh, working with like a, a bunch of the DEA agents and one of the one of the cool projects that we did there, speaking of Miami where you are, is that uh, Miami turned out to be the hub for the, the fake pain clinics that were just dishing out prescriptions and illegal prescriptions uh, meds all over the place. And, and Miami had more than the rest of the country put together all in one area, all in one geo zip. And the project that we did with the DEA was minimizing that pain clinic fraud, which is huge. And that was fun because these are not these are not business people who've gone to get their you know MBA or hospital administrators. These are cops. These are you know law enforcement agents who are running these projects. So that was pretty cool as well. And it was really fun. <clears throat> excuse me, really fun to bring that to a whole new whole new group, a whole new sector. That was very cool. I haven't heard that much going on in like police and um, you know law enforcement area, and I think you know, th but there's been inklings of those types of projects. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there for you know every little element of the government agencies to get um, you know introduced to some of these concepts and principles, and and uh, I can imagine I just think about like fraud and data analytics and stuff, and just some of the opportunities there that. Maybe they're already using some of these techniques and aren't even aware that it has a, a name or um, or maybe they have like systems that are guiding them, but they don't understand maybe the analytics behind the scenes that's helping, you know, detect certain, you know, primary spots or hot spots or potential areas to look into. I think that'd be probably interesting for them to learn kind of the origins of some of the statistical tools and analyses. You right on with that, Brian. That's exactly right, because. If you think of, uh, for me, and when our team got in there, you, you think there's uh, so much more sophistication than what you see on TV. But they really were just using still the maps with a string tied to it and a push pin and following people and searching through like, there were files and files and files of phone records and emails, but they don't, they hadn't had the skills yet or the insight to not only how to how to go about collecting the right data, but then what do you do with it? So they have all this information and now they've got stacks and stacks of paper. The next question, what do you do with it? What chart do I pick? Why am I picking that chart? How do I draw conclusions and interpret that data? They haven't really learned that. So you're right about the data piece. And now that everything's electronic and all these transactions that are leading a trail, you know, it's kind of like, finding the root causes to their problems is, is the DNA. Our, we had the DNA to their crime solving. It's like, there is a way to do this. There's structure, there are tools, there are methods to help. So even being able to interpret these patterns in their data to lead them to the, to the clues, it was in, in our experience, it was just a lot more fun you know, than trying to find out why is there a crack in the windshield. It's like finding the bad guys using the data they're leaving a trail, but us like helping to teach them how to read that data. So it was very cool. And for us, we found even that, even in these highly sophisticated 
transactional businesses. Like we, we, uh, one of our customers is a, uh, they do healthcare banking transactions. So they're big tech, they're, they're tons of data. They crank out data like crazy. They, if you walk into their office, they've got offices in multiple major cities. They've got all the big, huge screen TVs with their data all up and the charts are ridiculous. When we first started with them, like what, what is that telling you? They've plotted, they're plotted wrong, they're upside down, they have wrong things on the axis. So not only are they displayed incorrectly, and this is a high tech data company, people don't know how to interpret it. So we've done a lot of work with people who are professional data analysts and data scientists who know how to chug through data and put it on a chart. They're really good at the programming behind the scenes, but they haven't necessarily learned how to really pick the right chart understand why I'm picking that one as an analysis tool and then how to interpret it. So whether it's like big data or the ex cop who's now trying to get the bad guy, it's the same, again, the same tools apply. It's just, how are you gonna connect and talk with this person to let them know that, hey, we have something that can really help you to achieve your goals more quickly and to make your work more meaningful and joyful, which is really what it's all about. So it's, it's been really interesting. Like, I love that data topic because it's something we're particularly passionate about because we've seen it's really unusual to find uh, an organization that really understands how to interpret data properly. So it's just something that we think is pretty, pretty simple once you learn it. Um, it doesn't take, you don't have to you know, be a brain surgeon to know how to, to uh, accomplish this. It's pretty straightforward, but people just don't learn it. Just not something that is a typical skill. Yeah, I think it's a, you know just getting from having data and then displaying something. It feels like okay, we're done, but it's like no. If that if you don't know what to do, what action to take or not take as a result of that yeah. chart, is it really doing what you think it is, if, or is it just looking nice and makes people feel like we're managing the process, but if people can't explain it or understand it or know when to take action, I think that's uh, kind of the next level to get to. And I think a lot of organizations haven't got to that level. They just have the chart up that says, here's our output for the week, or here's our total call volume, or this is the number of transactions we had, but okay. And what about that chart? <laughs> Do I need to know yeah. to decide if it's good or bad? Right. That's exactly right. We see so many companies probably, I was just thinking about what's the biggest mistake or the most common mistake that we see. And I think it's pretty easy once we're in, we're in you know, a million different organizations. People like to put things on run charts. That's one of my favorite charts too. So we're plotting our data over time. And the common mistake is you see if it's defects or mistakes, you, you see it go up and people, why are mistakes up? Mistakes after you guys got to work harder, work better. And then the next week they, they go down. So you can look at this pattern. Great job. Because, you did it. Yeah. Yeah, great job. Good job, guys. What did you do? They're like, I don't know, but thanks. I'll take the free pizza. <laughs> so they don't know why it's gone up and down, but you look and once you really understand it, you're like, okay, processes vary. They go up and down. So if someone asks, hey, it was up. Why was it up? Because uh, it was down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why did it go down? Why did sales go down? Because it was up and things vary. Now, why is it varying? How much is it varying? Can we tighten that? Can we lower the average? That's the skill in really using your data to improve your business. And that's just not there. It's just not unless I, I feel like unless every place we go is an opportunity to teach that. And if we could, if we have two hours with the leadership team, I feel like we we rock their world with just giving them that bit of information. It's like just do this little thing right and it'll change your life. Yeah. So and then like I think. It's like now you bring it you bring it to the company or the organization that's serving the vanilla farmer in Madagascar. And how does that how does that help him? How does it, you know, how does it help the individual candle maker who's trying to trying to get ingredients for his candle that will burn for 20 hours? So it's a lot of what we've done as well is, and this is why I love the the topic that um, you've brought us together to talk about is bringing it into these sectors or these areas that don't have access or haven't been exposed to business tools and business methods and theories, but they need the structure 
been the proper way to do things even more than anybody else. So it's been really, really interesting for us to expand into these different sectors as well and see it work. It's not just it's not just cars in Detroit or you know auto manufacturing in Japan. It it really works everywhere if you have the skill to see how to make it apply. It. Is there some other yeah projects? I think I cut you off, but what was is there some other projects you want to talk about or anything related to nonprofit or NGO work that? Well, I think, um, had in the past. yeah, I think it's maybe some of the things we haven't talked much about are in, in hospitals. We've done a lot of work in uh, different smaller hospitals and then hospital chains, the larger hospital uh, um, systems. And working in hospitals is a whole, that's an, uh, another whole different type of an, you know, type of a scenario. Because that's a, they, like I said, they all have a lot of the same general uh, pressures and situation where they're trying to do more with less, they have tons of pressure, they have limited resources, uh, very un unpredictable uh, processes and customer demand. But hospitals, that's been something, and there's been a lot written and a lot talked about uh, Lean and Lean Six Sigma in healthcare. So it's not necessarily new there. Uh, it's just not, not typical that it's done well. So we've done a lot of work with hospitals and in all as aspects from hospitals, like delivering um, better quality care. So that's where we always start out is their, their thing is first do no harm. So minimizing the amount of, if we call it defects. So the amount of mistakes, uh, is, there's all kinds of, that we've worked on there. Uh, wrong medicine given, expired medicine, uh, patients given incorrect or delayed care, all kinds of things. Uh, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest changes that we made in uh, a hospital, and this is in the uh, Chicago and New York area, had the same issue. And that's that, uh, just, just an example of a project there, was that after routine uh, heart catheterizations, for example, many doctors got into the pattern of putting their patient into ICU <clears throat> just for recovery. Whether they needed it or not, it was just kind of the default. You know what? My patients will get uh, more intense care and the nurses will watch them more carefully in ICU. So they were flooding the ICU so that when a patient came in that needed intensive care, there were no beds available. So there were several dire outcomes because of that pattern. And working with doctors is a whole different type of, uh, whole different type of culture. So trying to get them to change their behaviors. And we haven't talked much about it yet in our, this conversation here, but understanding the culture and the behaviors that are acceptable and the behaviors of leadership, as well as everyone, everyone who follows those leaders, if you don't tap into changing those behaviors, your likelihood of success and st sustainability is almost nothing. It might be tiny and fleeting, but it's not gonna be big and it's not gonna be sustainable. So in these hospitals, having them properly use the levels of care and the step-down levels of care, which is what they call it, uh, from the most intense to the less intense, having them do that properly was, in our opinion, a major feat and having that be successful. And we did see a dramatic improvement. And then with the hospitals, we do all kinds of things like just having the beds ready, uh, you know, if you think about how long it takes to check out of a hospital, you're ready to go. You've been there for hours and hours and you sit and wait with your stuff in a bag for someone to say you can go. That can take, you know, six hours, seven hours, and you feel crappy to begin with and you want to go home. There's no reason for that. So we've done a lot of work in minimizing and shrinking that time. And as soon as you say you can go, you can go. So uh, the work with the hospitals, it's very satisfying because the Staff at the hospital, they are in general running ragged and they're trying to do the right thing and they have a million things that they can't get to. And basic things like 5S, 5S those supply cabinets, the supply closets, because people hoard equipment and they hoard supplies and things aren't there when they need them. And you have a patient that needs uh, a certain piece of equipment and the hose is gone or the cable is gone. It's not there. And these nurses literally spend hours out of their day just running around looking for pieces of critical equipment. Why? There's so much more important things to be doing. So they're so thankful that they'll actually come in 
after hours to learn it, how to run their project and to do their project work. They'll come in on Saturdays and Sundays or whenever their off schedule is. So it's a different type of employee who's like, please help us. We'll, we'll do what you say. Yes, we see it's working. Just tell us how to do it and their, their game. So it's a, a lot of fun and very, very rewarding working in that type of environment. But again, with all of these scenarios, and they're all really different in so many aspects, but it's what um, makes it work that is the same, and that's active support from leadership. So the worst thing leadership can do is, is push them in the other direction, is no, do things the way that we've always done them, and not support their, their, uh, the excellence, you know, the, the good practices that they're putting in place. The organization as a whole, no matter who it is, needs to have some humility and openness to look at where do they have opportunities to improve and not be an arrogant organization that we've been doing it this way for 30 years. You know, we've been in this business, we've been in government for 50 years and it's always been this way. It's like you have to have that humility and the calm to say, actually, let's take a look, let's take a fresh look. That's really a required ingredient. And I would say another required ingredient, no matter what the sector is the perseverance. So particularly with government, there's a lot of influence with the who's ever in political power. And when you have political people on staff, meaning that they came in with the current administration and they're, they're working with alongside people who are not political. In other words, they're, they're there because they got hired from, uh, they got hired for the position, not appointed. As every four years, you have the potential for half the organization of leadership to go. And when the new group of politicals comes in, they're like, we're going to put our own finger print on this, trash everything you've done in the past. We're going to come in with a new thing. And that just destroys this ability to continually improve. So persevering and understanding where we have good things going and sustaining and building upon results is a real challenge in the government arena. So being able to really solidify practices so that they're not vulnerable. It's not easy to unplug them and throw them away. It's make this last. So it's, it's much, much better to successfully implement just a few projects with lasting and meaningful impact rather than working on a ton of efforts that end up with temporary or poor results or that are just easy to unplug. So in the end, like, uh, more methodical, slow, but sure process is way better than taking on a ton and trying to make a huge splash with, splash with a million a million changes that are going to fizzle as soon as the next you know leader comes in. So it's not not totally unlike what can happen in the business world, but it's just more prominent and I would say more a little more extreme on the government on the government side of things. So just something that to be really aware of, it's, it's, you know, very apparent once you get in there and start working in the government, you're like, whoa, this is different than any business. The culture is very different, but you figure out how to work within that to make these important changes. And we found, you know, for 20 years in business, in the consulting business, up until we went electronic in this last year, we never did one bit of advertising or one bit of social media. Uh, we had a website, but that's only because one of our customers required that we have one to um, you know, have us be a, a proved vendor. So the point with that is that our results kind of speak for themselves. And then these people move on to another uh, organization, another part of government, and they say, hey, can you come to hear what you did over there? Yeah. So that's how we've grown our business and, and had a very healthy and exciting business for 20 years. So now it's getting a little bit different that we're moving into the e-space as well. That requires a different, um, uh, a different approach. But uh, the, the point is still that what, what gets us to be able to get in and make a difference is having successful, sustainable results. And I think we're all really proud on our team, really proud that we can do that no matter what the sector and it's most rewarding when you get into the nonprofits and the government where it's really untapped. It's, it's really untapped and it gives us huge opportunities. So it's a lot of fun and the people really appreciate it. And you can make some, it's small, it feels small at the time, but over time you make enough small 
cultural changes and things start to shift. And then you see, if you step back, you know, four years later, five years later for the biggest uh, parts of, of government, you step back and you go, wow, that actually, this is actually working. It's huh. still, that's still going on. The culture kind of changed a bit. And I can see, you know, you, you don't really see it until you step back after, after uh, a bit of time and you see how much improvement you've actually made. So it's been really, really exciting. Yeah, that's great. I think that's, you know, a whole host of different processes. I think it's really cool that you're able to kind of see the commonality between them. And it's like, I can just get down to that detail level of kind of what you said before, I think is the, what's the challenge and, and what was the change? Is, can you explain that again? The, you said two yeah, so, yeah, the two things, and usually when we meet a, a prospective customer or someone who's just interested in, can we help? Okay, a lot of people who who can really benefit from what we do don't even know to ask. So when we speak with people, we'll ask them those two things. What challenges are you faced with? And what major changes do you have coming up? And they will always have answers for that. Oh, my challenges are, we just had three people quit, we're in a hiring freeze, or we just had a major customer leave or a competitor's just taking over our place. So there's gonna be some major challenge that they're faced with. If you say what changes are coming up, there's always something. And when, you, when people hear changes, and we know the whole topic of change management is a huge one, yeah. but typically people don't feel great. Hey, there's a huge change coming. I'm probably gonna have to you know, work less and get paid more. They never think that. Uh -huh. It's always like, oh God, here it comes again. And at best, they feel like they just gotta kind of bury their head until the change passes because they've, they've seen change done poorly a lot. So when they hear, oh, we're going to get a whole new system implemented, or there's a new leader coming in, or did you hear that we're, uh, we're going to be merging with our competitor? We just bought them. What's going to happen? There's always some change coming up that they're faced with. And that's where we say, you know, we can help with that. And that's really what we do is say those changes and challenges, because the point is they've got big goals and they've got a job to do. And when we come in and work with them, the skills that we provide, that we coach them with and teach and then give them, when we leave, now they have those skills. It's not about the things that they already do well. That's their work. It's about removing the things that are gonna get in the way of their work, that are gonna prevent them from doing a great job and enjoying their day. And you know what? Going home to their family, feeling great and proud instead of completely drained and enervated. So it's, that's what we give to them. It's about removing the headaches, the things that slow them down. That's what our work is all about. So when we ask them what challenges and changes, you'll hear this, blah, blah, blah. They've got them right at the top of their head. It's front of mind. And that's when we can say, okay, we can see how to help with that. And we start to create a plan that we don't want to come in and say, oh, yeah, well, we've got another big change for you. You're going to start doing things the Lean Six Sigma way. That's like now what they want to hear. Yeah. So we listen to them and hear where are they starting from? And now how can we support and teach and coach and guide to start removing one at a time those frustrations and the, the things impeding them from doing a great job? So that's, that's sort of the changes and the challenges. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I think that, you know, gets them thinking more about not – how we're going to do that, but just laying out the problems or the things that are on top of mind. And then you're, you'll, I can see how you can easily find your really good, important projects that are going to get management support and resources dedicated to it and potentially a budget to go work those because these are the, the things on the top of their minds and these are the things that they're concerned about or worried about. Yeah, I like that. You know what, too? We have a, something, I think it's unique. I, I'm not sure how many other uh, organizations like us do this, but for customers who are especially uh, budget constrained, so a lot of times that is with with government, they have an allocated budget and they, they're they right up front. Like we have a grant for $25,000, what can you do with this? What's the best you can do? It's very different than going into an organization that says, yes, we are struggling. We're trying to serve this community. We're trying to serve this customer base. We have no budget. So sorry, we can't you know, use your services. We'd love to. Well, we have enough confidence in our work that we'll, we put our fees at risk. We'll say, sure, you, 
we have an option that says we don't get paid. You don't pay us a penny unless you see tangible, meaningful results. And let's talk about what those would look like. And if you don't save and grow and scale and increase your efficiencies, then we haven't done our job, we'll go away. But guess what, we will. So we're not worried about it. Yeah. So it's putting our fees at risk to say, well, we will actually put, we have as much skin in the game, but we do have strings attached to that. You gotta meet us halfway. As leaders, you have to support what we're doing. Don't undo our work or you're, you know, we can't be successful. So for us, a lot of times, like that's the best way to work because we can say, you have to do these five things and we're gonna talk a lot and make sure that you're with us there. And you have skin in the game, so do we, let's make this work. And it's really a great relationship and a great partnership with the customers that we work with. So it's, it's really been a nice, a nice aspect for us to be able to serve um, organizations that thought they didn't have the access to us. Yeah, I think that's that's really good. I mean, I think well, like when I was in Portland, we have um, a little group of consultants that we get together, and some of us have done some volunteer nonprofit work, and that's kind of a similar type of thing. Like, we know you can't afford it, or you're not sure about the value it's going to provide, and so why don't we come in and kind of help with uh, you know when we can or on our free time a little bit to help at least introduce you to and, and do some basic improvements. And then maybe that will kind of spur the need to say, I want to put a little bit more time into it. And usually that's been the case is they see, you know, at least, at least the need for more training or, you know, some more coaching on specific help or, you know, what else can you help us with on the next part of this journey? So I think um, for them to buy into it right away is just a lot to ask for them. But usually, yeah. you know, once we've kind of gone in there and helped a little bit, they're starting to see like uh, how how things are changing. Um, that we're not gonna, uh, you know, some of the pushback has been I, we don't want to work in a factory. That's why we're in the nonprofit sector, or you know, yep. so some of those barriers to get over of the perception of what this might be. Seeing it is kind of um, really powerful, and I think your approach of saying, hey, if we can't deliver, then there's no low risk for you. I think that's been a great way to yeah. get them started. You know what the flip side of that is, which is pretty interesting, and this, this happens in government. We've actually walked away from government uh, contracts because they literally, and I, this is no surprise to anyone, but they have a big chunk of budget that they've been allocated, and they're like, oh, we don't really want the results. We don't care about that. We just need to spend this budget so that we can up it next year. So... <laughs> Can you do a bunch of training? Like what's, what, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you can find anyone. There's a million companies who will do training and don't care about the results. That, that's the majority. Just take our class. We just are counting butts and seats and how many people registered. Good, go go there. We're, we're all about the results piece. So we've actually, and it's part of our, our core values as a, as a company is we're really focused on, on um, achieving significant results and doing it fast and making it sustainable, just that kind of cranking through, churning up dollars and churning through budget is something that does happen a lot in government. So for us, our, our ears are always a little bit perked. Is this just trying to, to spend money and gain funding? Or are you really looking for results? Because the funding piece, eh, that's not interested. So it's it's kind of an interesting spin and a different way to look at government as well, because that does happen. It's I think most people are aware of that kind of spending, yeah. spend so we get it next it. year. Yeah, you're going to lose it yeah. if you don't. School districts is another big one where we've played a lot. And I think that one that, that I, I can hardly think of a, a sector that needs structure and efficiency and more focus on real significant outcomes and efficiency to get there than the education system, the public school system. So in that, and in, in that's really where you see for in our experience, and I'm no expert in that area, but just from our experience where you see a lot of uh, spending to get the next year's budget. And we had ex one large school district that we actually convinced them, you know, we can do both. We can use your budget, sure. But how about if also we get really important results and we actually do focus on the education of the children and the efficiency and the structure that teachers can work with them to let them to deliver education. 
how about if we do both? And they were like, what's this you're saying? And <laughs> it took a bit of convincing, but we, we had some great success in that school district, but it, it took a bit of work to get them to care about the results. I think a lot of them are just like, oh, this is just, it's way too complicated. It's way too ingrained. It's way too old, uh, the status quo. It's just how it is. It's like, doesn't have to be. You guys are deciding to accept that every single day. <clears throat> so in education, that's someplace I think is another, you know, hugely untapped market, if you will. Very but exciting think, though. Yeah, and I think that's a, another thing that, you know, drives me crazy is, teaching someone, spending the time going through, and even as an instructor, yeah, I'm getting paid to be there, but um, I don't really care about the training. I, I'm, it's a means to get to results, because that's what I care about. Like, I'm here to teach you, so you get results. I don't want to teach it, and then you walk away and forget everything I learned. You know, I just yeah. take my time to teach this class to you, and if it doesn't result in anything beneficial, what are we doing here? You're wasting everyone's time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting the organization's time. You're wasting and, and money and, and you're wasting my time. So if this isn't going to result in, in actual results that we'll, you'll be excited about, your organization will be excited about, and I I will be excited about to see that you've gone through this journey and gotten the results and are excited to continue, then yep. yeah, let's let's drop it right here and let's not pretend because that's almost, that's a ultimate sign of waste, right? It's just doing something so like that for, and having no nothing to show for it. Yeah, and we're no different than any anyone else in it. You know, we're, we're doing a job and we wanna have meaning in our lives as well. Yeah. Like what we're trying to do is make a difference. So for us to stand up and blah, 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 blah to a room of people who don't care to be there and we know that's not going anywhere, what's the point? Yeah. There's no joy in that. So it's, you know, it, that, that piece and as, as, you know, like I said, for, for us having that value be very clear, that that's not what we're about. We'll go where there's richness and where that where we can create great environments and make improvements and create joy at work for other people. So it's it really it's been a lot easier for us and we get very clear about that with anyone who works on our team. And that's what we're about. But it works for our customers as well. Great. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, it looks like we're already at an hour. Um, this is great. Um, we could probably keep going another hour easily, um, but yeah. I don't want to hold you up too much. Uh, so maybe share contact information. How can people reach out to you and your organization? Um, yes. Yeah, so best way to connect. And then um, any other parting comments you want to make? Yeah, sure. So we're canceled. It's it's um, canceled, C-A-N-N-S-U-L-T dot org. And uh, we have rebranded, re have a whole new look and feel over over the last year in kind of lockdown mode. And we have put all of our, not all yet, so we've got a good amount of our products and services online for easy access. And uh, we're pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter. On our uh, website, we have a little button that's coaching with Cancelt, and you can talk to a master black belt if uh, you have questions or want to learn a little bit about something, we have full courses and certifications. We're accredited by the largest uh, Six Sigma accreditation house in the globe, that's CSSC. So we have Lean Six Sigma belt certifications and all of our courses we've broken down into bite-sized modules. You want to know how to run a great meeting? Take this module. You want to know advanced brainstorming techniques? We have a module for that. You want to know how to understand, interpret a, a run chart and a histogram and a control chart and box plots? We have modules for that. So bite-sized pieces or the full-blown certification. And uh, all of that is, I think, pretty easily recognizable and available on our websites. And uh, I think it's pretty fun to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter because we do offer a lot of uh, tools and templates. One of the things that's unique about what we offer is uh, like I said before, a lot of people in our work pull random templates and uh, diagrams from over the years of finding things that work for them. For us, we have the whole kit. We have an uh, online learning module, a workbook with practice that we talk you through, and then a template. They're all Excel, so it's easily accessible to anyone. We don't do anything in Minitab or the statistical software, which is kind of uh, getting quite outdated now. So we're really kind of upgrading to make it uh, easily accessible to everybody. 
for every um, lesson that we teach, every tool or technique, we have a one point lesson, a nice one pager. So we've got tons of those if you just want to refresh it. So you don't have to memorize what to do with a run chart. You just have the one page lesson, the one point lesson, and it's nice and easy access. So we like to think of it as our everything you need kit and in bite sized chunks or, or the whole certification, depending on what you're looking for. So we're really proud of what we've done in the last year, uh, staying productive over this weirdo year that we've had mm -hmm. and really proud to continue building that and, and getting it out to people so they have access as well. Okay, great, great. And so you, you are in Australia, but you are based in the US or you have people throughout? The world yeah, we're based or... in the US. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have okay. offices in, in Florida and Nevada, and we also have an office here in Sydney. So once the borders open, we'll be all over as we do work, you know, around the globe. So we do have offices. We're based, we're a, a U.S. company, though. So we're, we're actually uh, incorporated in Florida, but we work all over the place. Okay. Well, great. Well, hopefully you get to come back soon. It'll be great. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. This was fun. For you. Yeah, I appreciate it, too. I learned a lot. And, uh, yep, maybe we'll have you on a future podcast. Cool. Stay in touch. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Bye.